Section 12 of The Schoolmaster and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Tomko. The Schoolmaster and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov. Section 12. The Marshal's Widow. On the 1st of February, every year, St. Triffin's Day, there is an extraordinary commotion on the estate of Madame Zavsyatov, the widow of Trifon Livovich, the late marshal of the district. On that day, the name day of the deceased marshal, the widow Lyubov Petrovna has a recreation service celebrated in his memory, and after the requiem, a thanksgiving to the Lord. The whole district assembles for the service. There you will see Khrumov, the present marshal, Marfutkin, the president of the Zemstvo, Potrashkov, the permanent member of the rural board, the two justices of the peace of the district, the police captain Klinolinov, two police superintendents, the district doctor Vronyagin, smelling of iodoform, all the landowners, great and small, and so on. There are about fifty people assembled in all. Precisely at twelve o'clock, the visitors, with long faces, make their way from all the rooms to the big hall. There are carpets on the floor, and their steps are noiseless, but the solemnity of the occasion makes them instinctively walk on tiptoe, holding out their hands to balance themselves. In the hall, everything is already prepared. Father Yevmeny, a little old man in a high faded cap, puts on his black vestments. Konkordiev, the deacon, already in his vestments, and as red as a crab, is noiselessly turning over the leaves of his missal and putting slips of paper in it. At the door, leading to the vestibule, Luca, the sacristan, puffing out his cheeks and making round eyes, blows up the censer. The hall is gradually filled with bluish transparent smoke and the smell of incense. Gelikonsky, the elementary schoolmaster, a young man with big pimples on his frightened face, wearing a new greatcoat like a sack, carries round wax candles on a silver-plated tray. The hostess, Lyubov Petrovna, stands in the front by a little table with a dish of funeral rice on it, and holds her handkerchief in readiness to her face. There is a profound stillness, broken from time to time by sighs. Everybody has a long, solemn face. The requiem service begins. The blue smoke curls up from the censer and plays in the slanting sunbeams. The lighted candles faintly splutter. The singing, at first harsh and deafening, soon becomes quiet and musical as the choir gradually adapt themselves to the acoustic conditions of the rooms. The tunes are all mournful and sad. The guests are gradually brought to a melancholy mood and grow pensive. Thoughts of the brevity of human life of mutability, of worldly vanity, stray through their brains. They recall the deceased Zavziatov, a thick-set, red-cheeked man who used to drink off a bottle of champagne at one gulp and smash looking-glasses with his forehead. And when they sing, With thy saints, O Lord, and the sobs of their hostess are audible, the guests shift uneasily from one foot to the other. The more emotional begin to feel a tickling in their throat and about their eyelids. Marfutkin, the president of the Zemstvo, to stifle the unpleasant feeling, bends down to the police captain's ear and whispers, I was at Ivan Fyodoritch's yesterday. Pyotr Petrovich and I took all the tricks, playing no trumps. Yes, indeed. Olga Andreyevna was so exasperated that her false tooth fell out of her mouth. But at last the eternal memory is sung. Gelikonsky respectfully takes away the candles, and the memorial service is over. Thereupon there follows a momentary commotion. There is a change of vestments and a thanksgiving service. After the thanksgiving, while Father Yevmeny is disrobing, the visitors rub their hands and cough while their hostess tells some anecdote of the good-heartedness of the deceased Trifon Livovich. "'Pray, come to lunch, friends,' she says, concluding her story with a sigh." The visitors, trying not to push or tread on each other's feet, hasten into the dining room. There the luncheon is awaiting them. The repast is so magnificent that the deacon, Konkordiev, thinks it is his duty every year to fling up his hands as he looks at it, and, shaking his head in amazement, say, Supernatural! 
It's not so much like human fare. Father Yevmeny as offerings to the gods. The lunch is certainly exceptional. Everything that the flora and fauna of the country can furnish is on the table. But the only thing supernatural about it, perhaps, is that on the table there is everything except alcoholic beverages. Lyubov Petrovna has taken a vow never to have in her house cards or spirituous liquors. The two sources of her husband's ruin and the only bottles contain oil and vinegar as though in mockery and chastisement of the guests who are to a man desperately fond of the bottle and given to tippling please help yourself gentlemen the marshal's widow presses them only you must excuse me i have no vodka i have none in the house the guests approach the table and hesitatingly attack the pie but the progress with eating is slow in the plying of forks in the cutting up and munching there is a certain sloth and apathy evidently something is wanting i feel as though i had lost something one of the justices of the peace whispers to the other i feel as i did when my wife ran away with the engineer i can't eat marfutkin before beginning to eat fumbles for a long time in his pocket and looks for his handkerchief oh my handkerchief must be in my greatcoat, he recalls in a loud voice, and here I am looking for it. And he goes into the vestibule where the fur coats are hanging up. He returns from the vestibule with glistening eyes, and at once attacks the pie with relish. I say it's horrid munching away with a dry mouth, isn't it? He whispers to Father Yevmeny. Go into the vestibule, Father. There's a bottle there in my fur coat. Only, mind you, are careful, don't make a clatter with the bottle. Father Yevmeny recollects that he has some direction to give to Luca and trips off to the vestibule. Father, a couple of words in confidence, says Dvoryagin, overtaking him. You should see the fur coat I've bought myself, gentlemen, Hrumov boasts. It's worth a thousand, and I gave, you won't believe it, two hundred and fifty, not a farthing more. At any other time, the guests would have greeted this information with indifference, but now they display surprise and incredulity. In the end, they all troop out into the vestibule to look at the fur coat, and go on looking at it till the doctor's man, Mikeshka, carries five empty bottles out on the sly. When the steamed sturgeon is served, Marfutkin remembers that he has left his cigar case in his sledge and goes to the stable. That he may not be lonely on this expedition, he takes with him the deacon, who appropriately feels it necessary to have a look at his horse. On the evening of the same day, Lyubov Petrovna is sitting in her study writing a letter to an old friend in Petersburg. Today, as in past years, she writes, among other things, I had a memorial service for my dear husband. All my neighbors came to the service. They are a simple, rough set, but what hearts! I gave them a splendid lunch, but of course, as in previous years, without a drop of alcoholic liquor. Ever since he died from excessive drinking, I have vowed to establish temperance in this district, and thereby to expiate his sins. I have begun the campaign for temperance at my own house. Father Yevmeny is delighted with my efforts, and helps me both in word and deed. Oh, ma chère, if you knew how fond my bears are of me! The president of the Zemstvo, Marfutkin, kissed my hand after lunch, held it a long while to his lips, and, wagging his head in an absurd way, burst into tears. So much feeling, but no words. Father Yevmeny, that delightful little old man, sat down by me, and, looking tearfully at me, kept babbling something like a child. I did not understand what he said, but I know how to understand true feeling. The police captain, the handsome man of whom I wrote to you, went down on his knees to me, tried to read me some verses of his own composition. He is a poet, but his feelings were too much for him. He lurched and fell over. That huge giant went into hysterics. You can imagine my delight. The day did not pass without a hitch, however. Poor Alalikin, the president of the judge's assembly, a stout and apoplectic man, was overcome by illness and lay on the sofa in a state of unconsciousness for two hours. We had to pour water on him. 
I am thankful to Dr. Dvorniagin. He had brought a bottle of brandy from his dispensary, and he moistened the patient's temples, which quickly revived him, and he was able to be moved. End of section 12. Recording by William Tomko.